So let's talk about Chiller Startup. You know, that's one of the things that I find a lot of people don't understand enough about, or maybe they don't care enough about it. You know, I, I, I guess I struggle with the perspective. Is, are we really, do, do people just not want to put the effort in? You know, factories often, like they schedule four days for a chiller startup, right? I'm, I've actually got this scenario right now, and it's not like everybody, but Daikin in my area, they're having to schedule four days for a centrifugal startup. And I find that to be a bit crazy because, well, I know why. It's necessary because we as contractors either don't or aren't putting enough effort into the actual project itself, which is installing the chiller and getting it turned on. And what that leads to is they walk into a plant that's in complete mess and the chiller is far from actually ready for them. And all we did was pencil with the report in order to get them on site. So they're having to walk in and see what is not ready on the, on the piping side. They may have electrical issues and automation issues. And they've got all these issues they've got to deal with that honestly, all that should already be taken care of before they ever step foot on your property. So part of what I want to do is I want to take you through a chiller that we are actively getting ready for startup. And uh, I want to kind of point out some critical things that are going to go a long way in helping you have a more efficient uh, startup process. And it's going to take a lot of load off the factory people. And one of the good things about that is the more you can help them, uh, the more they're going to be apt to really uh, do you some favors along the way. And you just you start to build better relationships, whereas they walk into a plant where it's a total disaster, it, it gets real frustrating for them real fast. And, and that's their expectation. It's going to look like that. So this is an example of a startup form that you would normally have to fill out. Basically, just about every machine you'll ever have to do will have something like this. And they want all of this done because if you actually go through and do all this properly, they should have a very simple, just make some minor modifications and verify operation and watch it run. And then they can do like their data logs. So let's run through just a quick checklist of some things you could do that may not always be included in this. For one, get your start stop situated and any other controls you're gonna have, have that stuff done at least enough to make it turn on and that you don't need any additional programming. So in this particular case, we have our start stop. If we weren't gonna run start stop, we have the factory jumper. We've already removed that and we're not gonna have any other external controls except for uh, data communication. But the data communication is going to be after the plant gets a retrofit. So we've already got the data card in and it's going to be programmed later. And so that's not something the startup tech really has to worry about right up front. Another big piece would be verifying all the electrical connections are good, sound, and solid. There's nothing loose, nothing hanging out. You don't have any crazy flyers. And you know, you're happy with the general condition of the electrical cabinet. This also includes the main power cabinet. You want to go through and verify that all the connections are tight, nothing's loose, nothing Nothing's going to come out. The startup technician should also go through and do his own verification, but if you've already done it, then it just makes this machine more sound and we get a double check that both people have done a good job verifying that the equipment is going to function. And make sure your power is already done, it's hooked up, it's connected, there's not any issues. Sometimes, you know, you want to be cautious powering things up before the manufacturer gets on site, but overall, if you can, go ahead and get power to it. Make sure it's going to boot up. Make sure nothing crazy is going to happen. You don't already have a major issue right out the gate. You know, if you first put power to it, you did everything correctly, but maybe somebody at the factory didn't and the whole freaking panel blows out. Well, that's not your fault. You didn't create that situation, but now you haven't wasted anybody's time getting the startup tech out there just for him to turn it on and watch it blow up and have to order stuff anyway. So take care of that kind of stuff ahead of time. Make sure it's already good, it's sound, that your rotation or the, uh, the polarity of the phases is correct. You've got all three of your phases in a three phase scenario. You know, the, the power is sound. That is a major piece that not everybody uh, verifies ahead of time. So they have to troubleshoot through or, you know, tell you everything you haven't done yet and then just wait around for you to take care of your business. Another critical piece of that is get your leak searches done. You know, every machine that's brand new like that should have a full leak search done to it. I recommend doing that before you uh, get your water into the barrels, just in case if anything at all is happening, you can test that. You'd also open up 
uh, one of the ports on a barrel, and as soon as you open the barrel itself up for the first time, stick a leak detector in there and make sure it doesn't go off. That's a, you, you never know in shipping and all the torque and everything that happens between, you know, the rolling out of the factory and showing back up on your site to be put in, all the things that can happen that cause just the, just the slightest little disturbance or the problem, and now you've got a leak in the system. And if you don't verify all that ahead of time, you know, it can be, you end up in a place where you, you may have a major leak somewhere that has to be taken care of before startup happens. And in some cases, if you don't verify the barrel, for example, and you go ahead and you've got water to it before he even gets there, uh, it, it's hard to verify it once you've already got water in there. So you really need to do a full, complete leak search on the system as part of your uh, startup preparation process. That should, and when this, this is all, everything I'm talking about is not one chiller specific. These apply to uh, centrifugal and, uh, or water-cooled and air-cooled machines. Now there may be some slight differences in the minute details, but for the most part, this is, this is how I recommend you handle this process. Get your vent piping tied in too. You know, you'd be surprised how many machines I walk up to and there's no proper vent piping done. Or on this one, for example, it's it's all CPVC or it's actually Schedule 80. Like Schedule 80 is not code and I, I couldn't tell you, I don't, couldn't even tell you if it ever was. Honestly, I don't know how they got away with this, but you run into stuff like that on occasion. Get your copper out and use copper for your vent piping and put unions in. Use unions, make a huge difference down the road whenever you need to do any kind of servicing you're really going to be thankful you had them uh, and be cautious because like my crew for example they almost miss these little small ones up there on the suction elbow there can be relief scattered in several places on the machine those need to be vented now i don't know all the great details but my understanding i'll share that much and verify your specific situation when you get there but it is really critical that if you're working inside of an actual enclosed environment, in this particular case, I'm down in a basement specifically, and I'm in a complete enclosure. Uh, in some cases, you may be in a pit in the ground. That is considered an enclosure, even though it is open on the top. You also may be in a, uh, in a, in a yard that's fully walled in and it doesn't have any air venting on the sides of it. That is also considered a type of enclosure. You always have to make sure you're venting out of your reliefs to get above the enclosure so that if those vents ever go, it'll get rid of that refrigerant charge and it won't stack in there and become a hazard. You know, I've had uh, lines burst and I've had situations where I've flooded even pits outside. You know, the whole top is open, but that whole pit will just turn into one big cloud of refrigerant and you know, it's not safe. So you don't want that to happen with your relief though, if you can prevent it. So make sure you're venting that out to an appropriate place. If you're in a plant or in some kind of a room like what I'm in, uh, that has to go into a vent header or some kind of manifold that's gonna allow it to go outside and be vented outdoors instead of it being trapped in here. I highly recommend also getting gauges set up and temperature probes on all of your piping separately from what's on built into the machine. This way you have an ability to have a cross reference and most machines aren't monitoring water pressure. So if you get gauges like this, it helps with balancing, it helps with maintaining the machine long term. And then having temperature, you have another point of reference you can look at when you're trying to troubleshoot the system. And it just, it's good practice in my opinion. Now, something that didn't happen here, and this is something that my team learned in this process, whenever the piping gets put in, make sure the pipe fitters are putting hot taps in. I always recommend get at least two hot taps per every pipe, you know, a three quarter or one inch tap, you know, really a one inch tap, just two of them per is, is a great starting place. You can always reduce it down to something smaller, but at least with one inch, you're not restricted by the size if you ever need something larger long-term. So have those hot taps put in, and even if you don't decide to use them at the time, you can always put a ball valve or just a plug in them until you decide to use them in the future. Thankfully, in this particular case, we had extra taps on the chiller, and we were able to achieve our same goal without having a pipe fitter come back and put those taps in. In addition, you also want to pressurize with water the 
barrels before you go through the whole installation process. So part of what can happen is if you go ahead and insulate everything before you put water to it, you could end up having leaks. And we actually had that case here. We had to go through and all the were leaking once they got here. So we had to remove all of those temp sensor wells and reseal the threads on them because they were leaking brand new. Now, if we had already insulated, you know, say that happened at one of these Vitalics, for example, or here at the end bell cover, then we would have to remove all that brand new insulation, tear it up, fix the leak and put it all back together. You also need to make sure you have balancing valves. So that is really critical that on the outlet pipe, I highly recommend in something like a butterfly it's a prime example you can do it through the actuators but it's more challenging because you have to set the stops on the actuator to where it can only open so far so i really really recommend that on all your outlets you always have a butterfly that you can dedicate to balancing that barrel for flow and getting your gpm set correctly you should also go through and work on setting the flow balance ahead of time you know and you should be able to get the gpm flow chart and take a pressure differential. Now, something you gotta be careful with. That flow chart is almost always gonna be in feet of head, not PSI, and most of the time we're measuring through PSI. So what you need to do is you're gonna take each of your PSI uh, measurements and then convert them first. Don't, don't try to take the differential between them and then convert the differential. Convert the reading and then compare that to your flow chart to make sure that you have the uh, specified GPM that you should have gotten with the submittal data. So that's a, that's a critical part in the, pro in the startup process and you need to make sure that you're able to meet those re requirements before the startup technician gets on site because guess what, there may be a problem. Maybe there was something with the flow or the pump. There could be something there that's an issue and if you don't verify that ahead of time, he gets to show up and identify to you that there's a problem here and this is not my problem to fix. And so now it's another thing that you now have to take care of because you didn't verify that you could achieve the factory GPM ahead of time. Now, there are actual formulas to convert to feet of head. Personally, I just make it simple. Go online to Google. There's a PSI to feet of head conversion online. Punch in the numbers, do the conversion. There you go. Keep it simple, right? That's one of the things I want you to do. Now something you have to take into consideration during the flow and balancing process is if you've got multiple chillers, like in this particular plant, we have a true lead lag redundant system. So the chillers aren't going to ever run together. The load in this building never gets high enough for that. So we'll cycle them based off a of schedule and we'll also be, you know, redundancy so that if one ever goes down, we have the other. Well, what you also have to keep in mind in that is uh, with each chiller, you need a pump to stage up with it because uh, if you try to, you know, with, with just one chiller on, which, you know, right now, so the, the lead chiller is the one that's, that's currently running and the one we're trying to do startup on is the redundant or the secondary chiller. Well, if all we do is open the valves and try to balance the system and set it with only the one set of pumps running for the one chiller, then we're likely gonna have an in inaccurate balance because that, that chiller, when it runs by itself, is gonna have all the GPM flowing just to it. It's not gonna be sharing with a different chiller. So you have to be careful of stuff like that. You know, either turn a second pump on to keep the GPM where you need it, or you're gonna have to isolate and shut down the other chiller so that you can get a proper accurate balance on the chiller you're working on. In this particular case, that's what I wanna do. I wanna shut down the other chiller and I wanna create the scenario that that chiller we're starting up is actually gonna see on a daily basis. Something else you should focus on is make sure all of your temperature readings are accurate. Temperatures, pressures, everything on the display. And this is part of, you know, getting a, not a startup, but you're powering up the system and you're going through and verifying all the sensors ahead of time. If there's a problem with the sensor, then at least you can walk into it knowing that there's a problem, or maybe you could resolve that problem before that technician ever gets there. So for some of you, I understand you're gonna have a place of, well, this is why I'm having a factory startup to begin with. They should go through all this. They should deal with all that. Those aren't my problems. But 
I really don't agree with that mindset, first of all. And then second of all, there's a lot of these things that that technician is going to tell you, hey, these aren't my problems. Like, these are your problems you have with the machine. I can't finish start up till they're fixed. And you really quickly find yourself in a place where he's having to make multiple trips to come make repairs and do this and do that. And it turns into this whole nightmare because there are, there, there are too many of the wrong issues that are gonna to lead to a lot of delays. And then now you're the one stuck with a messed up schedule because it doesn't impact him. You're the one that's gonna be impacted when you've got deadlines to meet and you can't meet them because you didn't do enough to confirm that it was actually ready for him to turn the machine on. I want to thank Phil Pulse for sponsoring this training. You know, they do a lot to really try to grow and build and educate in this industry and this trade. And they're just, they're a fantastic group of guys. I really encourage you to reach out to Michael and Gabe, have a talk with them. They have a fantastic service software. They're going to take care of you. So if you're interested in upgrading your service system or getting more paperless or digital and, and getting maybe your technicians more independent in the field, then they're the guys you want to talk to. So reach out to them. Michael, Gabe, Phil Pulse, link in the description. Thank you for sponsoring this video. This is not an exhaustive list of every little thing, but these are some really big key points that are going to make a huge difference in your ability to have a very successful startup. And there's one other piece to this that this is fantastic practice for you, especially if you're somebody who's maybe not as experienced with these type of machines, then you can really learn a lot by having to go through this process and go through each of these little components and each of these little pieces and verifying that they're good and it, it, you'd be surprised how much you learn along the way and really digging through and reading through the manual and verifying it's correct now i do want to throw a disclaimer out there for those of you who haven't already commented that no the relief piping did not have vibration isolators it is recommended in this particular case we just didn't put them in and i understand that other people aren't going to agree with that and I'm okay with that. It just, anyway, I it just, I know the comments are coming. Regardless, it just, it's fantastic practice. It's good learning. And it's interesting because I, we have factory startup routinely. Like I'm actually certified by the factory for this machine, but it makes sense in various ways to have the factory tech come out with the latest and greatest and do his process. And it gives the customers a lot of confidence that they actually had somebody literally from the factory show up you know they they like that kind of thing and it helps in selling the job it's it is an actual selling point we can push even if we can present like hey we have certified people but if you want it we'll give you factory startup right so there's real reasons to do that even if you are capable of doing it yourself but when you have that factory guy walk through the door and he's literally had most everything that was going to give him a horrible headache taken care of and all he's got to do is do what he's really good at which is fi filing through the fine details verifying it's all good and okay and then calling it good and being able to walk away it's a positive response and you can build good relationships because they realize that they're working with somebody who really cares really applies themselves and it's strictly because of that. Guys I've never met before, but I provided them an easy experience and they were able to come in and I've, I've got some strong connections for life in my career. And guys that have actually, you know, since then, they've gotten me out of some binds. Like there's been a couple of times I've been in some hard spots, been able to call those guys and get out of them. And that, that, that was a direct result of me putting this work in and giving them a good experience on the job site.